Good evening, I'm Scott Hicko, and thank you for joining me for this video. I'm going to finish up with Ephesians here, uh, the book of Ephesians, a letter written by Paul. It has so much in it, and I'm sure I missed a lot, but um, this is my third video on it. And I want to kind of summarize it because I think it hits on one of the most important misunderstandings of Scripture that has destroyed the church, that has destroyed the true nature of who Jesus Christ is and who God our Father is. And it's a misunderstanding of the message given to Israel that has to do with law and the message given to the nations which is apart from law. A message that includes law and is apart from law cannot be the same message. But what people try to do is they try to mix those messages into one and then they get something that is not true at all because it dilutes the message of law and it dilutes the message of grace because they need to be kept apart. When you put them together it makes no sense and that's where you get false teaching. But before I get into that, I just want to finish up here in chapter 3 of Ephesians, starting with 19, going to verse 21. What is the breadth and length and depth and height? To know the love of Christ. Okay? What is the most important thing here to do? The, the breadth and le length and depth and height. What is the most important thing? that Paul is talking about here. Is it following the law? Is it doing good things? Is it helping the poor? Is it um, following the law? You know, those things might be good things, but is that the most important thing? No. Paul is telling you what's the most important thing here. What is the breadth and length and depth and height? To know the love of Christ which transcends knowledge that you may be completed for the entire complement of God. Now to him who is able to do super excessively above all that we are requesting or apprehending according to the power that is operating in us, to him be glory in the Ecclesia and in Christ Jesus for all the generations of the eons of the eons. Amen. So the greatest thing is not to do good deeds or follow law to get to Christ. The greatest thing is to know the love of Christ. The love of Christ doesn't just love you if you do good deeds and follow the law. The love of Christ loves you in your worst moments when you can't do anything right. When you're a vile, sick, sinner, worthless, useless, that's when Jesus loves you. He saves sinners, not people who think they're righteous. He came to seek and to save that which was lost, those that are helpless. You know, it's easy to love lovable people. You know, if someone you know is very kind and polite, pretty, um, always do the right thing, it's easy to love them. And it's no great feat to love them. But when someone is mean, angry, abusive, vile, if you're going to love them, then that shows a deep love, that you will stick with that person even when they're at their worst, even when they're unlovable. And that's what Jesus Christ does. He shows off his love by calling out sinners when you're at your worst, when you're enemies to God. That's when he calls you. That shows love because it's not based on something that the creature can give to him. 
It's all based on him going and get a creature, getting a creature that's not worthy of love. That shows the greatest love. And that's what Jesus Christ does. So to know that love, to know that no matter what you are, what you have done, what sins you have committed, that Jesus Christ is going to work all that out and justify you and bring you home to heaven so that all the experiences and pain and evil that you went through are going to be a stepping stone to a greater joy that could not have been possible for you if you didn't go through those things or commit those things. And then it's not up to you to sustain it, get it, attain it. But no matter what, Jesus Christ is going to let it unfold in your life and cause the greatest things for you to happen so that you will be with God forever with the greatest joy you could possibly have. And you can't ruin it. You can't mess it up. Because it's not based on you. It's based on Jesus Christ. That is love. And what Paul is saying here is to understand that love and let that drive your actions. So do good deeds because you know what has been done for you. Don't do good deeds because you think you have to achieve or earn that love. Those are two very different things. And then to think that Jesus can do super excessively above all that you are requesting, apprehending. So that's basically he can do... Think of the greatest thing that you could possibly apprehend or think of. We all have great imaginations and great visions of what Jesus Christ is and what heaven is. Well, think of the greatest possible solution to all the pain of humanity and our greatest possible destiny for each individual human being. And then whatever you think could be the greatest possible thing, what Jesus Christ does surpasses that because you can't even think about how great the things are that he's going to do we can't even our minds can't ascend that high and that glorious but that's what is prepared for us that is what is waiting for us the beginning of chapter four it says i am entreating you then i the prisoner in the lord to walk worthy worthily of the calling that you were called so yeah you're called Call it, you're called to be in the body of Christ, or maybe you're not called. That's God's choice. But if you believe the whole process is that you walk in thanksgiving and walk worthy, worthily of your calling, whether you walk worthily or not does not mean that you're not called. Walking worthy, worthily is a reaction to being called. So if you can't walk worthily, sorry, that's a hard word for me, worthily, if you can't walk in righteousness, that doesn't change the fact that you're called. Being called is a reaction to this. There's a parallel verse here in chapter uh, 4, verse 30, and it says, And do not be causing sorrow to the Holy Spirit of God by which you were sealed, for the day of deliverance. This is again talking about it's not based on your behavior as to whether you're sealed or saved for God. It says, do not be causing sorrow to the Holy Spirit of God by which you are sealed for the day of deliverance. So you are sealed for the day of deliverance no matter what. So of course you don't want to cause sorrow to the Holy Spirit. But even if you do, you are still sealed. That's what that verse means so here's the gist of it we do want to do good works we want to walk worthily of our calling but we are saved by Jesus Christ his death entombment and resurrection and because he did that for us and justifies us and gives us his righteousness based on nothing we have done we walk in good works and we live in thanksgiving and love and appreciation for what was done with us, for us. We don't do works and do good things in order to achieve the love of Christ. That's putting the onus on the human to get to Christ. But Christ did it for us. Our good works are a result of what Jesus Christ has given us. Not rules we have to follow in order to earn 
what Jesus Christ has done for us. Um, the rest of Ephesians here in chapter, um, looking at still in chapter, what chapter is this? Chapter 4, starting in verse 17. All right, I'm not going to get into that. I'm going to finish up here. But going back to the great deception that is in the church, it's the misunderstanding of the message to Israel and the message to the nations. The whole Old Testament was about a family, Israel, following the law of Moses and their inability to follow that law. It was all based on the law. They brought sacrifices to the temple. They uh, were rewarded if they followed the law. They were punished if they didn't follow the law. It was all based on law. And their Messiah, Jesus Christ, which a lot of Israel rejected, came to fulfill that law. Israel couldn't do it. That's what law was there for, to show us our unrighteousness, that we can never attain the standard of God. No one can follow the law. If you break one iota of the law, you break the whole law. You can't ascertain to that level of perfection. So the law is undoable. Jesus Christ came, and since he's the Son of God, he did the law, and he's going to put that law on the hearts of Israel. And Israel, when they rule in a thousand years with Jesus Christ on the earth, they will do law. And they will do it perfectly at that point. And the nations will follow that law as well. But it's all based on law. Even though God causes you to act in a way that follows the law or causes you to act in a way that doesn't follow the law, it's all based on God. All is of God. For in Him we live, we move, we breathe. And he forms every detail of our life. But the Israel message is one of law. Of following law. And accepting the Messiah that completed the law for you and writes it on your heart. So it is an action of grace from Jesus and law. So you do have to do certain things. But the message that the Apostle Paul gives to the nations is a message apart from grace. I'm sorry, apart from law. It's pure grace. So if you look at the Old Testament, if Israel followed laws, then God blessed them. If they didn't follow laws, then God punished them or removed himself from them. It's a give or take. That's law. You do this, I do that. You don't do that, I'm not going to do that. You follow me, I'll be your God. You don't follow me... I leave you to your own devices and you'll be punished. That's not the message that the Apostle Paul gives in Ephesians, Galatians, and all of his letters. His message is that Christ Jesus was glorified. He died for sin, was resurrected, and he gives his righteousness and everything that he did through his faith, he gives it to the nations, to people that he chose to believe, apart from law and not based on anything they have done. So the law doesn't even come into effect. In Israel, if they did bad things, then bad things happened to them. But here, the greatest sinner is given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's not based on what you do. It's not a message now that if you don't do this, you're not going to get this. It's not a give and take anymore. It's a giving 100% of Jesus Christ to the creature. See, that's something that Israel can't handle. The, the circumcision gospel can't handle. Because they are so attuned to law that they have to do something in order to maintain the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Where the Apostle Paul says that you have to give up on yourself completely and give up on doing anything and understand that it's only Jesus Christ that can give you the righteousness based on what he did apart from any law or works at all. So that means that you do nothing, whether you do good deeds or bad deeds, you're saved because of what Jesus Christ did. 
And you do good works because Jesus did it for you, not in order to earn what Jesus did like the law does. Anyway, when you, when you mix the Israelite message of law with Paul's message of grace, you come up with something that is not a gospel. You come up with a lie. And then you invade the perfect righteousness that Jesus Christ gives us, all based on Jesus Christ, and you inject law into it, meaning that people have to do things in order to attain what Jesus Christ did when Scripture says that Jesus Christ did it all for us, regardless of our actions. That's where we come into the problem. We have to separate the two. Israel will follow law, and they have been saved by their Messiah, Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus, who appeared to the Apostle Paul, the same Jesus, in his glorified form, gave a new message, a secret, that is of pure, unadulterated grace, meaning that you cannot follow law to get it, you cannot fail that law to lose it. It's all based on Jesus Christ doing it for you and putting you in the celestials because it's his choice and it's apart from law. Don't let law creep in and mess up that perfect message of Jesus Christ.